This is Randy Shell, and I am recording a pre-interactive classroom podcast before the flipped classroom on perioperative hypothermia and hyperthermia, and I've labeled it just the facts. If you look at the ABA keywords related to this topic of hypothermia and hyperthermia, you can see uh, keywords such as spinal anesthesia and hypothermia, the physiology, physiologic effects of hypothermia, Sweat glands, how are they innervated? Sympathetic cholinergic, how can you prevent hypothermia? Forced air warming is number one. What happens to cerebral blood flow uh, as the patient becomes hypothermia? It decreases. Oxygen delivery to the tissues. Well, if you're cold, your oxyhemoglobin curve will shift to the left and you hold on to uh, oxygen more and don't deliver it as well to the tissues. What happens to your blood gases? Talk about that when you're cold. What can you do in the operating to prevent patients from getting cold? Radiant heat loss is number one, and if you warm the room, that's something that you can do to prevent uh, heat loss, creating a neutral thermal environment. Why do kids get colder than uh, uh, mid-aged adult patients? What about the use of cooling patients uh, after cardiac arrest? Is that beneficial? and then some causes of hyperthermia. But the main content is on hypothermia, and you can see from the ABA content outlined below, hypothermia, the etiology, prevention, treatment, complications like shivering, and the effect on oxygen consumption, and then a little bit on hyperthermia, non-malignant, not MH. So let's look at the hypothermia and spend most of our time on that. The definition, less than 36 degrees centigrade. When we measure temperature, uh, we can measure core temperature in the nasal pharynx, in the lower one-third of the esophagus, the tympanic membrane, being careful not to puncture the tympanic membrane when you put in uh, probes uh, in the um, ear canal, and the pulmonary artery catheter with a thermistor on that pulmonary artery catheter. Note that temperatures from the forehead, the axillary, oral, bladder uh, read less than the core uh, temperature. And so we really want to know core temperature and frequently use nasopharynx. Geriatric and neonate patients are susceptible to hypothermia. Why the elderly? Well, they're losing some of their autonomic control, don't vasoconstrict as well. For example, neonates have a large surface area to lose heat from. What are some of the problems of hypothermia? Well, enzymes, proteins in your body, uh, do not function as well under colder conditions. So enzymatic function of our body, especially, for example, the coagulation system and hemostasis is impaired. Arrhythmias can occur. Patients can take longer to awaken. Kidneys don't work as well and a cold diuresis can occur. But there are some potential benefits of hypothermia, specifically inducing hypothermia down to about 33 degrees centigrade for 12 to 24 hours in comatose survivors of cardiac arrest has been shown to be of some benefit. The physiologic effects of hypothermia are shown here. First of all, on the brain, oxygen use by the brain goes down, therefore blood flow goes down also, and hypothermia is associated with reductions in MAC. Uh, EEG, if hypothermia is very cold, uh, cold, down into the 15 to 20 degree range, you can have an isoelectric EEG, and uh, mild to moderate levels of hypothermia reduce SSEP signal um, ability to get that signal. Uh, and see it well, and it takes longer for it to get through. So monitoring SSCPs in a uh, situation of hypothermia more difficult. The cardiovascular system, uh, there's an increase in systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance, and with mild hypothermia, catecholamines go up, norepinephrine level goes up, stress hormones. And as the norepinephrine goes up, SVR goes up and PVR goes up. Now in very cold conditions, uh, uh, this may not hold true, but for mild uh, levels of hypothermia, think increased systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance. In that patient with pulmonary hypertension, this could be really bad. Uh, in the patient with heart failure whose SVR goes up, that could be bad for that heart also. As the temperature goes down, bradycardia frequently occurs, dysrhythmia, specifically things like ventricular premature beats, as well as a prolonged PR interval and junctional dysrhythmias. Shivering, the shaking of the uh, muscles, um, and especially with rewarming, can increase oxygen demand significantly and cause myocardial ischemia. The respiratory system is also affected. As I mentioned, pulmonary vascular resistance goes up, all those catecholamines going up, constricting the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance. 
Um, hypoxic drive, the ability to hyperventilate if you become hypoxic is reduced. The solubility of carbon dioxide in, and oxygen in blood uh, goes up. In other words, more can dissolve in it, and so less of it's creating a partial pressure above it. So the P little AO2 and P little A CO2 go down as you get cooler, and we'll show you uh, a graphic picture of that next. So blood gases are changed by uh, uh, hypothermia. And there's that left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dis dissociation curve making uh, it more difficult for oxygen to be released from hemoglobin. The coagulation system is made up of a bunch of enzymes uh, and there's reduced clotting activity and also the platelet number and function is uh, not as good as you get cold. So a cold patient in surgery could bleed more. And then the kidney uh, has many enzymes in the tubules that are responsible for reabsorbing ions, for example. Uh, and you just don't work as well when you're cold and you lose sodium and water and you can get a cold-induced diuresis. Now, the effect on the arterial blood gases of hypothermia is shown here. And we'll look at the far left. The temperature, if it's low, CO2 and PO2 uh, the partial pressures are reduced because oxygen and carbon dioxide are more soluble in the blood at hypothermic temperatures. They don't exert as much of a partial pressure. They don't bounce against the wall with as much kinetic energy when they're colder and they create a less of, less of a partial pressure. So uh, if you draw a blood cast in someone who's colder versus normal uh, thermic, that colder patient, uh, that patient I should say, who becomes cold their CO2 goes down and it looks like a respiratory alkalosis and their PO, P little AO2 goes down some just because of the hypothermia. Now if we want to avoid hypothermia, one of the most important things is just keep the operating room temperature warm. Um, radiant heat loss, radiating uh, the temperature from your body to cold areas in the uh, room such as the walls. Uh, is one of the number one ways of losing heat. So just turn up the temperature in the room. Most effective rewarming strategy of someone who's cold and you want to rewarm them uh, is uh, forced air re uh, warming or putting a bear hugger, for example, on a patient. And when you rewarm someone who was cold, as they rewarm, they'll go from a vasoconstricted to more of a vasodilated state. And if you didn't adequately volume resuscitate that patient as they vasodilate, you may unmask an existing hypovolemia and uh, then witness hypotension. And as you rewarm, oxygen consumption goes up as the tissue temperature goes up. They use more oxygen and produce more CO2. Uh, so oxygen consumption and CO2 production are altered. And if the patient shivers, uh, their oxygen consumption can go up dramatically, several hundred percent and myocardial ischemia can occur. So how do we treat shivering if it occurs? Forced air warming uh, is helpful. Uh, Demerol or meperidine is unique in its aspects of reducing shivering. And in a patient who is already sedated and ventilated, uh, neuromuscular blockade will stop the shivering. Temperature regulation is in the brain, thalamus, and hypothalamus specifically, and general anesthesia and spinal anesthesia mess with it. General anesthesia, uh, as the body goes to sleep, uh, uses less uh, oxygen, basal metabolic rate goes down, and if you paralyze someone and even let them temperature drift down a little bit, which it frequently does uh, under general anesthesia, uh, basal metabolic rate will go down even farther. They also have impaired vasoconstriction and shivering. It won't vasoconstrict as much, won't shiver as much, so it's easier to lose heat. But um, as their temperature goes up in the operating room, it's frequent to see patients sweating because sweating seems to be pretty well preserved. So uh, hypothermia can occur frequently, and when hyperthermia occurs, sweating will often uh, be present. Spinal anesthesia also impairs temperature regulation diminishes thermal regulatory control. The more spinal segments are blocked, i.e. the higher the thoracic uh, level, T1 versus a T10 block, for example, more thermal regulatory control is lost, the higher the block. And they vasodilate the patient below that level. They can't vasoconstrict when they get cold as much, uh, and they won't shiver as much, so they will also lose heat.
uh, under both general and spinal anesthesia. And that mechanism of heat loss and the pattern of heat loss is characteristic. First of all, the mechanism, number one, is radiant heat loss, that is radiating uh, body heat to uh, uh, the walls of the operating room, for example. So keeping the temperature of the operating room up will reduce radiant heat loss. Conductive heat loss, if you're in contact with, say for example, a metal table, you can conduct heat into that metal table. Convective heat loss is if you have uh, air blowing over you, for example, and you're uncovered, uh, you can lose heat by convection. And evaporation is another form of heat loss. The pattern is characteristic and is shown on the far right. There's an initial rapid decrease, uh, and that rapid decrease in the first 30 to 60 minutes or so is not loss of uh, heat to uh, the room, for example, mostly. It is actually redistribution of heat from uh, the core to periphery. In other words, uh, if you vasodilate in the periphery and your hands and feet and legs are cooler than the core temperature and that blood mixes together uh, because of vasodilation related to the anesthesia, uh, that redistribution and mixing of the, that blood results in that rapid drop initially in the first little bit of an anesthetized state. That initial rapid decrease is secondary to redistribution and then the late decrease is uh, where it kind of levels out this plateau phase is just a passive thermal steady state or um, possibly the body has initiated thermal regulatory responses like vasoconstriction to maintain heat. There are some complications of hypothermia. The ones in blue stand out. Wound infections, white blood cells don't work as good. Uh, transfusion requirements if you're coagulopathic, i.e. your coagulation enzymes don't work as well and your platelets don't work as well, obviously blood loss can be more. And if you have more dysrhythmias and you're shivering and using more oxygen, and myocardial ischemia could occur, and morbid cardiac events can occur more commonly in hypothermia. Adrenergic activation with mild hypothermia means the norepinephrine levels, epinephrine levels go up, and uh, that can have a detrimental effect on vascular resistance, including pulmonary vascular resistance. Lastly, uh, hyperthermia. Uh, when the temperature goes up, uh, there's some questions that you should ask. One, have you given a transfusion? Uh, if you started a transfusion and the temperature goes up, obviously you worry about a transfusion reaction. Did you administer any MH triggering agents like succinylcholine or a volatile anesthetic? Uh, where's the site of the surgery? They're messing around in an affected area of the body and you have bacteremia occurring. And then what drugs have been given recently? And uh, there are drugs associated with uh, increases in temperature, one of those being anticholinergic drugs which will reduce uh, uh, sweating and uh, uh, can result in uh, hyperthermia, especially in uh, neonates. So hyperthermia most commonly is caused by just too much warming. Uh, the room's warm, you have forced air warmer on, you forget about it, it's set on 43 and the patient's temperature rises. Rewarming from cardiopulmonary bypass and overwarming uh, frequently occurs. Infectious agents, uh, bacteremia, drug induced, as I mentioned, anticholinergic agents like atropine uh, can block uh, sweating and result in temperature elevations, especially in neonates and infants. Malignant hyperthermia with a pattern of succinylcholine and or volatile agent being administered and a, a rapid increase in carbon dioxide, in temperature, tachycardia, modeling, rigor, um, and treatment with dantrolene, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, a slow onset MH, some have called it, where uh, anti-dopaminergic drugs, usually antipsychotics are administered and they develop a similar pattern to MH over often days, hours to days. Opioids, specifically meperidine, um, but other opioids and MAOI inhibitors also can cause a drug-induced hyperthermia. Transfusion reactions we mentioned earlier, and then there's metabolic causes that should not be excluded, including hyperthyroidism, thyroid storm, and pheochromocytoma. <clears throat> this ends the short podcast just prior to the interactive classroom, flip classroom, on uh, temperature issues in surgery.